Are y'all ready to jump into the book of Ezra? I am so excited. Ezra is a post-exilic book, meaning it was written during the time after the Jewish people had been exiled from the promised land. Before we begin chapter one, we need to take a look at the background and context so we can understand why God's chosen people were exiled from their land. Hundreds of years earlier, God had delivered his people out of Egypt with a strong hand. They were supposed to go from Egypt to the land God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would give their descendants. But instead of going directly into the promised land, the Jewish people ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years due to their rebellion and unbelief. Under Joshua's leadership, they finally entered into and took possession of the land. But God had warned them beforehand through Moses what they needed to do in order for things to go well with them in the land. Deuteronomy 28, 1 and 2. Now it shall be if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Several verses after that tell all the ways they will be blessed if they obey the Lord. Then starting at Deuteronomy 28, 15, but it shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes with which I charge you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. The rest of the chapter, 53 verses detail all the curses that will come upon them if they do not obey. It says this starting at verse 47, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you. Verse 49, the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as the eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you shall not understand, a nation of fierce countenance who will have no respect for the old, nor show favor to the young. That's exactly what happened. The books of 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles in particular chronicle the idolatry and wickedness that overtook the land, much of it led by the kings who ruled the land. This is when prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and many others that God sent were warning the people to repent and return to the Lord. In 722 BC, Assyria invaded the northern kingdom of Israel and took many of them captive. Only the southern kingdom of Judah remained, but in 586 BC, Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar invaded and destroyed Jerusalem. They had already taken some of the people captive prior to this, but now many of them were taken captive to Babylon. But God, who knows the end from the beginning, had told Jeremiah what the length of their captivity would be. 70 years. And at the appointed time, God began to bring his people back. Ezra was one of the exiles who returned, although he is not actually mentioned until chapter seven. Okay, let's jump into Ezra one. I'm starting at verse one, reading from the New American Standard Version. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. 
Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. The way the book of Ezra starts, it is immediately intriguing. Something big is happening. Like good Bible students, we are going to put our investigator hat on and look for the five W's and an H. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Let's start with the who. Interestingly, the subject of the first sentence is God. It seems like it's Cyrus because his is the first name that's mentioned. But look at verse one. It says, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. The Lord is the subject. He is the main who in this verse. He's the one doing the action, which leads to our what. What action is he doing? He stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia. Why? It tells us in order to fulfill the word that he had spoken by Jeremiah. When did God do this? When did he stir up the spirit of Cyrus? He did it in the first year of Cyrus's reign. And the where is the kingdom of Persia. The how is interesting, right? How did God do this? How did he stir up the spirit of Cyrus? I'm going to save that for a little later in the video. Our next who, of course, is Cyrus. He's the king of Persia. Nebuchadnezzar is no longer the earthly ruler. It is now Cyrus. So you read this and wonder, okay, who is Cyrus? Is he mentioned anywhere else in the Bible? We are investigators, so we don't want to immediately consult the Bible study notes or a commentary. One easy way to find out if someone or something is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible is to search in your Bible app. Or my go-to for searching words in the Bible is BibleGateway.com. If you search for Cyrus, you'll see that he's mentioned in four other books of the Bible. Second Chronicles, Ezra, Isaiah and Daniel, who was himself in exile. If you check these cross references, you're blown away by what you find in Isaiah. This is what it says, starting at the end of Isaiah chapter 44, going into 45. This is God speaking. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple your foundation will be laid. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I have also called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. This is incredible because it is considered to be 150 years before Cyrus was even born. Years before the Jewish people went into exile, God had a plan for how long they would be there and who he would use as an instrument to lead them back home. In his sovereignty, he anointed Cyrus. He would raise up Cyrus to be the ruler of the land and he would move Cyrus to send his people back home. Okay, so what is Cyrus doing? He is issuing a proclamation telling God's people to go up 
to Jerusalem and rebuild the house of God. My translation says house of God, yours may say temple. When is he doing it? In the first year of his reign. Why? God stirred up his spirit to do this. He even says God appointed him to rebuild the house. How is Cyrus doing this? He's sending out the proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and he says he's putting it in writing. And we have the entire proclamation in verses two through four. Another who in these verses, Jeremiah. Jeremiah prophesied prior to the invasion of Babylon. God said this in Jeremiah 29, 10, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. A couple of key words to observe in this first chapter of Ezra, build or rebuild, house, and Jerusalem, which is mentioned three times. Continuing verse five, then the heads of fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose, even everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. All those about them encouraged them with articles of silver, with gold, with goods, with cattle, and with valuables, aside from all that was given as a free will offering. So now the focus turns to a new who, the exiles themselves. In particular, it says the heads of fathers, households of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites. What are they doing? It says they arose. They are going to go up and rebuild the house of God. Very important that the priests and Levites are a part of this because they're the ones who serve in the house of God. When did they arise? Seems like right away. It doesn't say months went by. The king issued the proclamation and it says, then they arose. Why? Well, they heard the proclamation, but it was more than that. It says God stirred up their spirit to go. Now we've seen it twice. Verse one, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus. And verse five, everyone whose spirit God had stirred. So huge, saving it for the end. So we've got the exiles going up to rebuild. How? How are they going to do this? Cyrus had directed that they be supported with silver and gold, goods and cattle, a free will offering. That's exactly what we see in verse six. Those who were going up to Jerusalem got the support and encouragement of others around them. They were given silver, gold, goods, cattle, valuables, and a free will offering. Continuing verse seven, also King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and put in the house of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and he counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. Now this was their number, 30 gold dishes, 1,000 silver dishes, 29 duplicates, 30 gold bowls, 410 silver bowls of a second kind, and 1,000 other articles. All the articles of gold and silver numbered 5,400. Sheshbazar brought them all up with the exiles who went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. Look at Cyrus, he is back in action. Verse seven says Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord. Verse eight says more specifically, he had them brought out by the treasurer. Why? It doesn't state expressly that God told Cyrus to do this, but clearly this was part of what God stirred him to do. We're told that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken articles of gold and silver and other precious articles from the house of God in Jerusalem, from the house of the Lord, which means they were set apart unto him and holy and put them in the house of 
his gods. So we see Mithridath, the treasurer, counting out these articles to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. We're told what the articles consisted of as well as their number, and that Sheshbazar brought them up to Jerusalem with the exiles. What a chapter. We learn so much about God in this chapter. First and foremost, we learn that God is sovereign. Psalm 103, 19 says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. That's what we see here. He had spoken through Jeremiah as to how long his people would be in captivity. And he spoke through Isaiah as to who would decree their return? And we see his sovereignty in bringing it to pass. What's interesting is that Cyrus is well aware that it is God who has given him his earthly power. Chapter one, verse two, he says, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Nebuchadnezzar thought his own might and power had gotten him to the throne. God had to humble him. He was driven away from mankind. His dwelling place was with the beasts of the field and he was made to eat grass like cattle. And he was made to do this, Daniel 4.32 says, until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. At the end of all that, here's what Nebuchadnezzar had to say. Daniel 4, 34 and 35. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever for his domain. Dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, What? have you done? That's what we see in Ezra chapter one, God doing according to his will among the inhabitants of earth. We see his sovereignty on display. Cyrus is the earthly ruler. God is the supreme ruler. In your own life, do you recognize God's sovereignty? Is there something happening in your life right now where you need to rest in his sovereignty? When we are enduring difficulties, heartbreak, health challenges, loss. It can be so hard to recognize that God is sovereign and especially hard to rest in it. But it's also a blessing to be able to say, Lord, I know you are in control. You have a purpose in this. Help me to trust in you. What else do we learn about God in this chapter? He provides. He didn't just direct Cyrus to send his people back and leave them to wonder, how in the world are we going to go about rebuilding this house? He provided resources for the rebuild. They left with silver and gold, goods, cattle, free will offering. That's who God is. He did the same thing when he delivered his people from Egypt. He told them to ask of their neighbors and they received articles of silver and gold, which they were able to use to build the tabernacle. Oh, we have to remember this in our own lives. When God directs us to do something, he doesn't leave us to scramble and figure out how we're going to get it done in our own strength. He knows what we need and he directs us to the resources. He sends people who have the resources or the skills or whatever it may be. He provides. We learn that God fulfills his word. It doesn't matter how much time has passed. Doesn't matter who appears to be in control. The Jewish people were under the authority of King Cyrus. They were exiles in a strange land. In a sense, their lives were in King Cyrus's hands. But because God is sovereign and because he's almighty, he was able to fulfill his word. In Christ, we have promises in the word of God, but our minds always go to all the things that stand in the way that make us think 
In this case, where we're concerned, God is not able to fulfill his word. It just looks impossible because of this person or that thing or this hurdle. And it gets discouraging because so often we have to wait and wait. But God is faithful. He fulfills his word. And we learned this, which I saved. God is able to stir up our spirit in accordance with his will. We often wonder, how will I know what God would have me to do? How will I know if this is his will or if that is his will? What if I miss him? Cyrus was a pagan king. By all accounts, he was not a believer. And yet, before he was born, God anointed him to do his will. And at the appointed time, he stirred up his spirit to do it. He did the same with the exiles, stirring up their spirits to return. If God can stir up the spirit of a pagan king such that he knows this is God and it's just impressed upon him to obey and do it, do you think he can't make his will known to us who are in Christ? We have his spirit. So you may say, but how does he do this? How does he stir up our spirits? Have you ever had something on your heart and mind that you just can't let go? Something you feel that you have to do? There may even be a sense of urgency attached to it. It doesn't have to be what we may consider a big thing. He might stir up your heart to call someone. You just can't shake it. You might be in the middle of something, can't do it right now. Then it comes to your mind again and again, and you're like, okay, let me do it right now. Then you make the call and you find out why you needed to make the call. It was right on time. He may stir up your spirit to move to another city, state, country. He stirred up my spirit to leave my career as an attorney, something I never thought I would do until the stirring became unmistakable and unavoidable. We should take comfort in this, that God is able to get our attention and lead us in his will. When we want to cling and walk in his will, he will be faithful to make his will known to us. And I have to end with this Words from King Cyrus's proclamation. He said, whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. That's all they needed to know that God was with them. That's all we need. Whatever the task, whatever the season, whatever the challenge, if God is with you, you have all you need. Don't forget, subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you in the next one. Meanwhile, keep clinging.